Okay, and welcome to Global Lawyers of Canada's third um, virtual mentor office hours. Uh, I am your host today, Siobhan Lennox, and today we have an extra special guest. We have Megan Griffiths joining us. So we're very excited to have Megan here. Megan is an internationally trained lawyer, and she's going to run through her experience of getting to where she is now in her career. Um, She's had a few changes along the way, um, and she's going to give us a little sneak peek behind the curtain into life in the Department of Justice for us. Um, so Megan, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit of your background, your ITL experience for us, and basically summarize your resume. Sure, yeah. Welcome everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your day to, to join us and join me. I know it's hard with all of everything that's going on with the global pandemic and it's a very unprecedented situation. So it's nice to actually be able to connect with everybody. A um, little bit about me, I'll just start with a little bit of my background. I actually got into the legal profession as a legal assistant, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, wanted to make sure I wanted to go to law school. So I was a legal assistant, then a paralegal and realized I wanted to be making the decisions and you know coming up with a lot of the strategy um, on files. So at that point, it prompted me to go. I finished my law degree in England and decided to come back to Canada and wrote the NCA exams. Um, during law school, I did contract work for the immigration firm in Vancouver that I worked for as a legal assistant and paralegal. So my background was in administrative law, specifically um, immigration law. So very small niche part of law, very interesting. Um, but during my articles, I wanted to expand a little bit more. So I split my articles, which is not common. I went to my principal and said, the whole point of articles is to do as much as you can, touch on as many areas as you can, and really figure out where it is you want to end up as a lawyer, because the profession has so many options and there's so many places you can go. So he, luckily my principal was incredibly supportive of that. And I started looking for um, either a secondment or splitting it right down the middle. And I ended up in corporate securities law, which is very different. <laughs> and I can say that the first week at my articles there, I was told to review some warrants and options. And I wasn't sure if they were talking about warrants for arrest. I didn't think I was at a criminal firm. So I started putting in some phone calls to other lawyer, young lawyers I'd met along the way and started asking them for their CANS notes, anything that they could teach me about securities law um, quickly and just kind of navigated my way through that. I worked at the uh, corporate securities firm for um, a short while after being called to the bar, but quickly realized that solicitor's work wasn't really for me. Um, really wanted to get into court, really wanted to litigate. Um, the owner of the firm at the time had didn't understand what litigators did, <laughs> didn't care to understand, which was fine. Um, he was much more of um, an individual who really liked making the deals and papering the deals. And, you know, everybody has their own, you know, interests. So he was happy to, you know, wish me all the best. And I ended up falling into personal injury because I, realized I could get into court very quickly. Family, personal injury, and criminal are guaranteed ways to get you in front of a judge. <laughs> so immigration experience as a paralegal and then whilst you were articling, did that help you when you moved across? Because that's a big it, switch from corporate securities work. Yeah, it did. It helped me in the sense that I, I made connections in the legal community. So I had a resources. Um, if there was something that I was faced with that I needed some more, uh, you know, notes on, or I needed to, I didn't really understand a legal concept. I could actually phone up the lawyers at my old firm and say, do you know anyone that practices in this area of law that I could just give a quick phone call to? 
And they were fabulous with that. And it also helped shape my decision to go into litigation because even though it was immigration administrative law, we were in front of immigration tribunals. Um, so uh, that kind of piqued my interest when we got to be in front of them and actually see um, the decision making and the presentation. And I remember thinking um, that my boss at the time when I was a legal assistant and then a paralegal, I remember thinking he was very, very scattered in the office until I saw him in front of a tribunal and in the federal court and it was laser focus. And I remember thinking that's, that's why, you know, you have the breadth of clients that you do. Yeah. Um, just turned it on. It was incredibly impressive to me. <laughs> so yeah, so I ended up working in personal injury um, very, you know, specific area of law, got, just tried to soak up as much as I could, learn a lot about the BC Supreme Court rules, filing, um, how to make strategic decisions in a litigation realm. Shortly after that, um, I decided that I wanted to expand that further. I did plaintiff and defense, and so I started getting into general insurance defense. So I started doing some coverage work, um, larger, more catastrophic injury claims, um, getting into property loss claims and expanding that way. And then I became a mom. <laughs> and shortly after that, I figured, you know, I'm kind of up for a new challenge. And my foreign training, um, going to law school in England, really made me realize how adaptable lawyers are. Lawyers, are, you know, we kind of get pigeonholed into a particular area of law and deciding that that's where we're comfortable and, you know, that's where I'll stay and that's absolutely fine. But the law, we're trained to learn the law and we can learn any area of law that we want to at any point in our career. So it can be challenging, but it's always interesting if you are a person who gets bored really easily, like myself, uh, to constantly keep reinventing yourself, keep challenging yourself, and keep expanding your career. Um, I think it gives you some of the most rewarding, uh, rewarding outcomes, I think. And so shortly after becoming a mom, I, there was a posting um, for the Department of Justice for the federal government and I thought you know what I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring and see what happens there's many different um, sections in the Department of Justice uh, I chose between I was choosing between two sections and the section I chose is called business and regulatory and they service 38 different government departments it's basically general civil litigation, and you never do the same thing twice. <laughs> so when I was uh, canvassing and researching whether this was a move I wanted to make, um, somebody in the department actually said, you know, it's not for everybody. People like to specialize in certain areas and then they find themselves unhappy in this particular section. Um, there's other sections that are more specialized. So make sure that's something you want to do. And I thought that was a perfect fit for me. Yeah. So now Ben, I've been in the private practice uh, for, I was in private practice for about seven years and now I'm in the public sector. Um, there's some very big differences between the two. I didn't realize how big until I made the move. <laughs> um, about this, was, before you signed up to be a mentor, we briefly talked and you said there is quite a big difference between having a traditional lawyers and um, pri private client clients and then having a client now when yes. the public sector yeah so, the difference with the public sector is your it, when you're in private practice your client is often an individual a corporation um you know a pretty defined institution and you're able often to have a point of contact with them whether it's an adjuster from an insurance company or whether it's an, an actual individual client and when your client is the crown or the attorney general of Canada um, there's a lot of different uh, 
opinions and people that you're going to be dealing with. But there's a concept called, um, the overarching concept called that Canada speaks with one voice. So it means even though in one action, you may be dealing with five government departments and each government department, you're answering to three individuals, what may be good for one government department might not be good for another. So you can have internal client conflicts that you then have to navigate and come up with some common ground. So I wouldn't say it's, a, you're not acting as a mediator, but there's a lot of bridge building. Okay. And it can be a new kind of challenge as a litigator. You're used to having your client advocating for them, you know, pretty, pretty strongly. Um, in this case, it's a lot of uh, collaboration and a lot of bringing people together to come up with a concept that works for everybody. Um, so the good thing about that is it's very rewarding work. Um, you do get to work with a lot of litigation teams, which I've always really enjoyed. I think it's so much more fun to be in the trenches with colleagues <laughs> than being by yourself. Yeah. Um, it's really great that way, but there is um, some bridge building that will go on other than private practice. <laughs> So did you find that your experiences from beforehand where you were calling on colleagues and various other people as you were learning different practice areas, did you find that experience was helpful in terms of now how you were like building these relationships um, in your new position with your various internal clients? Yeah, no, it was, a, it was extremely helpful. I think going to school in England, I think, you know, you kind of create another family away from home. You're very much relying on, you know, your fellow student body. You're all in it together, you know, and people that come back to Canada with you or people that have been through a similar experience, you definitely gravitate towards them as well when you come back. When I came back from England, I didn't have a very big support network. A lot, there weren't many Canadians going to law school overseas and the ones that were not many of them seem to live in BC. <laughs> so um, I didn't have a very big support network, but the network that I did have, I hung on to and very much, you know, held it very close to me because I realized how important it is to support one another inside the profession. And the profession really, the profession as a lawyer, what you put into it is really what you're going to get out of it. It's, it's a great, great group of people and people more often than not are willing to help as long as you ask. And so I think my experience from being in England and coming back and having to reach out, um, translated into my articles yeah. and then translated into my profession. Um, the more that you connect, the more opportunities you have, um, and the better counsel you'll, you'll become. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, I know nothing about DOJ, absolutely nothing. So this is great for me. I'm learning so much. <laughs> so I really appreciate this. Um, I know we had one question. So this is kind of going back from before. For, for those people who missed this at the beginning, Megan was actually a legal assistant and then she became a paralegal before she even considered law school. Um, and so one of the questions that we had was, um, what do you think the qualities are that a firm is looking for in a paralegal? Now you were promoted internally, correct? Yeah. With the yeah, I was, I was promoted internally, but I've also had a lot of uh, support staff and paralegals and legal assistants. A lot of my paralegals have actually become very good personal friends of mine. Um, I'm still in touch with uh, paralegals that I've had at previous firms. Um, we still get together. Um, the skills that firms are looking for for legal assistance, we'll start with legal assistance, would be very much organizational skills um, and being very proactive, um, being very personable. Uh, I'm sure you can speak to this as well. I was a legal assistant as well when I moved to Canada as I was doing my NCA exams and absolutely like 
as lawyers, we're not necessarily the most organized individuals because we have so many different things going on in our head. And part of the reason we can do that, and you were mentioning this before with your um, principal, where you thought he was kind of scatterbrained yeah. earlier on until you saw him once he was in a tribunal, is that we, I think, anyway, we rely so heavily on our administrative support to help us streamline our practice so that we can jump from one client to another, whether we're in private practice or we're working um, in the public sector. And um, so, yeah, organization skills, 100%. <laughs> I think it's also a very key to realize that the, the biggest help you are because we rely on the staff so much. Um, I remember being, when I was a legal assistant, at least the way that I looked at it was I was doing my job to help make the lawyer's job much easier. So when I saw my boss being extremely stressed out, you know, I would just intervene and say, is there something that I can help you with? Yeah. Um, is there something that I can take off your plate and organize? Um, I just, you know, he found that very helpful. Sometimes lawyers are not trained at all in school to deal with people management or <laughs> to deal with how to, communicate with support staff or even colleagues sometimes we're trained to deal with clients and so sometimes lawyers sometimes need a little push <laughs> a little push from the staff and say you know this is due today and I know you've got a million other priorities but I need you to make five minutes for me um, and you know you'll thank me when it's over <laughs> because you'll be glad that we did do this um, paralegals, same thing. Uh, the paralegals, I, ha I have been so, so lucky in uh, my career to have amazing, amazing paralegals. I mean, the attention to detail is phenomenal. Um, the research that they're capable of, and it is, you know, a quasi legal role in terms of I do entrust my paralegals to catch things, and I do ask that they come to me if they think that there's a better way to go about something. And I remember when I became a paralegal in immigration, my boss, even though I was promoted from internally, brought me into the office and we had a sit down and he explained to me the difference um, in my role and that I was going to be completing, I wasn't just going to be filling out all the forms and, you know, keeping his appointments and things like that. I was also going to be you know, gathering the information directly from the client. So I was going to have a lot more client contact. He asked me to strategize which avenue we should go in terms of the application. And if he had told me to do A and I thought B was better, I would, it was my responsibility to bring that up with him. So it's, you know, a lot more responsibility, um, but that can be very exciting too. Yeah. And, and it led you to go to law school. Yeah. When yeah. you got that experience. Definitely. Yeah. Then, you know, the, I'm always blown away by the amount of um, detail and knowledge that paralegals have. And I think that that's another really good tip if you're going through articles as well. Lean on the paralegals, really do. I, when I got to the securities firm, I quickly realized that my boss's paralegal knew everything. She knew where all the precedents were. She knew all the clients by first name. She knew what writing style my boss liked. <laughs> um, so I quickly went out for lunch with her <laughs> and said, please help me. <laughs> you know, I'm going to need you to, you know, assist in navigating this. I, you know, I don't really view the legal profession in any way as a hierarchy. We're all part of the same team. We just have different roles. And I very much wanted her to know that, you know, I needed her. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. I would have, like, I'd be lost without my assistant and my paralegal right now. Um, I've been messaging them all day long. Where's this hiding? Where did you put this? How do I do this again? Um, and especially now when we're working remotely, uh, you know, I'm relying on them so heavily for where things are, and I'm beginning to realize how much I rely on them um, because normally they they just sit around the corner from me. So it's super easy to just as I walk past and fill up my like glass of water or something to ask them a question. But now they're not sitting around the corner. I actually have to think about it and ask them for information. And they are a fountain of useful and useless information that makes my life easier. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 
no, it, it, they're, they're very, um, very valuable. I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. And I think from a legal standpoint as well, it's very important as a lawyer, as counsel, to understand also um, the liabilities that that carries with. Because um, I know when I became a paralegal, my boss emphasized as well, he goes, you know, I'm responsible for you. And it's the same thing as if you're an articling student, you're operating under somebody else's insurance with um, the law society of the province that you're in. So at least for British Columbia, and I know that um, although the council was relying on me, there was also that added um, level of trust from a liability standpoint um, that I took very seriously. And if you have staff that understand that, or if you are staff and you understand that, it's incredibly important. So that kind of um, goes to a question we just got, which was um, for an articling student, do they need the same skills as a paralegal or are they quite different or is there an overlap between them? I would say there's an overlap for sure. Um, the reality is the paralegal has probably been doing the job a lot longer than you. <laughs> so even though you're, you're, for example, in articling you might be be asked to draft a mediation brief because it's incredibly, you know, important for you to know how to do this. You're crafting a legal argument. You're doing it in a way that's going to be presented somewhere. And it also helps you to get to know the file. So very useful task for an articling student. But the prior to you being there, chances are that lawyer may have asked the paralegal to pump out the bare bones of that mediation brief. And chances are that paralegal has been on the file a lot longer than you. So um, even though you're getting a little bit more in depth with the legal argument, the analysis, the case law, um, quantifying the claim, you're responsible for doing all that. I mean, you can always go to the paralegal and say, you know, I need you to send me copies of all the pleadings. I need to know um, where would I be able to access this? I'm confused with all of these cross claims. Could, you're familiar with the file. Could we have a meeting for 10 minutes and you could walk me through it? So there's going to be an overlap of um, some, you know, role in terms of what you're going to be doing at the beginning of your career, but they have a wealth of knowledge in terms of the clients and what's going on in the firm but you have the legal background in terms of law school and that training. So there is some overlap, but there's some distinction as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. In my experience, they're very, very clued in on the procedural side of how to do things. But yeah, in terms of applying the law to that, that's where they rely on the lawyer to do that. So I know that my paralegal does that now for me. She will set out various bits and pieces and she'll remind me of key dates that are coming up and different forms that we have to file for different things but the content is down to me to complete and yeah she can review it and it's typically my paralegals have always been female so that's why i say she it's not because they're all female um she'll go through it and she'll be like i don't know this sounds kind of weird like this isn't how we normally would write that and so she's kind of a great person to like flag things for me, but she'll be like, I don't know what it needs to say, but I know that doesn't read the way this normally reads for me. Um, so yeah, I would agree. There is definitely an overlap between the skills, but there is more that a law, that an articling student will bring than, not, than a, just a straight paralegal. Um, there's definitely like um, being a paralegal first is such a great foundation and I'm sure you found this, Megan, that it just made your life so much easier because you knew a lot of the procedures and also where to go to find out what those procedures were. Right? Yeah. Like there's the blue book. I didn't even know what the blue book was, but apparently my paralegals rely on the blue book in securities law all the time. And I was like, what on earth is this blue book? And they're like, this is the blue book. And I was like, oh, it's literally blue. Okay. That explains it. You know, I would never have known that because I'd never seen it in its book form before. It's not something I was ever taught at law school was this magic book that has all of these different documents in it um, for definite. And so hopefully, um, Olafunke, that answered that question for you. Um, Catherine, do you want to unmute and ask your question? 
Is that okay? It's not scary. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, I had a bit of litigation experience in in my home country. It was also a common law country. So we pra I practiced in the personal injury as well as family law, just like you. Mm -hmm. So do you feel there's any procedural similarities? In terms of your, your home country and here? In, a co in any common law country. There's, I think, I don't know about procedural, but there's certainly some foundational case law okay. um, that can carry over and trends that can also be drawn upon. I mean, to this day, I, I mean, we just drafted um, a response for leave to the Supreme Court of Canada and referenced case law from England. So, you know, case law I was familiar with. <laughs> Thank goodness. So um, there is some of that. The procedure, procedurally, in terms of filing um, court procedures, things that your paralegals would be familiar with, I'm sure that's a, quite different. Um, but I know in terms of some case law and some um, foundational uh, cases, that it's very similar. And Canada has broken away on some some of those, um, but. The key is just knowing that you've learned an area of law in your home country. And if you have the ability to do that, you have the ability to do it here. I mean, that skill set is going to transfer over. And as you're learning um, what is different in Canada, you're going to draw some parallels between certain things. And you're going to actually be able to critically think about the judgments in the case law probably better than somebody that this is all they've known you know so there's going to be some skills that are definitely going to cross over on the skill set i don't know if i can say generally that the procedure is the same but there are some foundational common law cases that are still consistently referenced uh, and just a follow-up question sure. in terms of family law do you feel there is any similarity again it, the family law as far as i've seen it's uh, 80% of litigators here are self litigators. So uh, how is the, is there any scope for family law here? Is, there is. is it, there is, 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 does it depend on mediation or is it court mandated? Both, both. I, I haven't practiced in family law. Um, I have friends that do. Um, there are small family law firms. There are larger firms that do have family law sections within their firms. I would agree with you that a lot of the family law lawyers are either smaller firms or um, somewhat of sole practitioners. I would say two, three, four lawyers in a firm. Um, I see family lawyers in court all the time. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I do. I was actually uh, standing in line for a chamber's application uh, at the end of last year, and it was absolutely backlogged the court, unfortunately, um, due to some urgent matters that had come up. And I think the three groups of people in front of me and the two groups of people behind me, all, all were there on family matters. Yeah, and mediation is, I mean, I'm a huge fan of mediation generally. I think it's great and it, I know it's utilized a lot in family as well, but I wouldn't say it's primarily uh, mediation. Some of it's court mandated for sure. And I think right now mediation is being encouraged, um, especially as we're going through this pandemic, um, because if a court, you know, if a, set, a case can be settled out of court right now, they're definitely encouraging that if possible. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, definitely mediation is increasing. Um, I know here in Vancouver in particular, there's more and more mediation specialists cropping up. Um, there is. They even have special courses in how to mediate, and it's hours and hours and hours of learning that you do on top. So it's definitely um, a, a specific skill set um, that they're trying to encourage, and they're offering support for those people who are interested in doing it. So starting, starting a mediation practice, um, I've known people that have done this, it, it's a bit of a grind at the beginning. As you explained, there's a lot of courses, there's a lot of work you're doing on top of your regular client work. Um, getting into a firm or having some form of support system that's willing to carry you and support you through that learning process to get a mediation practice off the ground 
I've been told again and again by meteors that that was really key. And they have had nothing but wonderful things to say um, about their firm or their practice that has supported them through that. And often it's the bigger picture. So the firm is, you know, looking at it and saying, okay, well, you're going to kind of be preoccupied with this uh, for quite a period of time that we're not going to be able to give you a lot of files or clients or work, or you're going to be offloading it to other people, but it's the greater gain um, later on down the road. If, you know, successful mediators are highly sought out. Um, I, I've got, you know, a few mediators I love to use and I can tell you they are booking into the end of this year already. <laughs> so <laughs> they're quite busy, quite busy. Absolutely. Catherine, I think it's similar to when we were talking to our mentors last week and they were saying how they were building up their practice um, and how it took them time to build it up and how they sacrificed certain aspects of their practice that they were currently doing in order they could focus on building up this side of their practice. And um, I think it's kind of similar in that sense to what they were saying last week in terms of mediators. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, Yannique? Do you want to ask your question? Because it's a pretty good one. Hopefully she's still there. Do you want me to unmute you? Just Hello. Hello, uh, there you go. Hi. Hi, so I just wanted to know, um, seeing, you know, you said earlier, Canada speaks with one voice. Um, do you find it challenging, especially when departments have become specialized, they think they've been practicing an area of admin law for years, so they know it. Is it a challenge to get them to defer to legal counsel? And um, when you actually get them to all agree, um, how, like, what do you actually, what are the practices, what are your recommendations to ensure that this happens in a way where none of your um, departments that make up that one client are, um, sets or disgruntled like I, I i can imagine that's very <laughs> it's that's challenging a, yeah, that <laughs> no, you don't want to be in where you're stepping on anyone's toes so how do you get across that hurdle that's a really good question and i actually think that even though it's a more large scale working in the public sector. I, I've also encountered this in private practice as well. I've had situations where I've been representing a large uh, institutional client and um, the person that I was taking my instructions from um, very much, you know, as you said, thought that they had been doing it a lot longer and had certain ideas of the way the file should be handled. Um, some of which legally, uh, some of the recommendations legally I was not allowed to do. <laughs> so um, overcoming that hurdle for me was very much, uh, I, I think face-to-face -face meetings go a long way. Um, I practice that now, a lot of our clients obviously our client contacts are all over Canada. And I think if I can get at the very least a virtual face-to-face -face meeting, if there's somebody at a regional office, I can get to come into my office um, and you know, start kind of rallying the troops, so to speak. <laughs> I think you have a lot bigger effect explaining something in person than you do through an email. At the very least, pick up the phone. Um, another approach that I've utilized has always been, you know, I ask them at the outset, what are your concerns about this? Because everyone, just like in mediation, everybody's got a different agenda, a different set of concerns, and a different set of um, things that they want to achieve. So from my perspective, my first step to finding common ground is understanding what everyone's concerns are. 
because they are likely going to be completely different. And then I can start drawing parallels between the two and saying, okay, well, your concern is a financial one and another client's concern is a reputational one. So how can we deal with that? You know, it's true that, you know, you know, not very nice reasons from a judge was more likely to hurt this one client versus this other client. Um, it's very much like having almost a joint retainer with on a family matter. Um, you know, you're kind of trying to bring or an immigration matter for, for instance, you're trying to get people to reach um, common ground. So in person uh, meetings, asking them at the outset, what are, what are your key concerns? What do you want to achieve from this? They may want to achieve the exact same end, but just have different concerns blocking their way to get there. So then you have to start weighing their concerns and figuring out which are their primary concerns out of their probably laundry list. <laughs> and also trying to figure out which ones um, kind of cancel each other out, which ones are not really a live concern, which ones you can deal with at the outset, and what does it really boil down to? And then at that point, getting everybody into a room <laughs> and presenting solutions instead of just talking about problems. You know, at the end of the day, we, you know, you got to go through it and everyone's going through it together. So we got to figure out a way that's going to address, at least in part, the major concerns of those clients or the individuals you're taking instructions from. And I've found that to be uh, pretty effective without having to, you know, run it up the line. Another thing I try to resist, and I did this in private practice when I had an issue, um, I very much try to resist going above the contact's head. Um, in private practice, when I was dealing with an institutional client, we weren't, who I was taking instructions from was not um, seeing the risk from my point of view, um, from a legal standpoint. Um, their concept of the law was quite frankly not accurate. Um, so when that happens, I want to deal with the individual first and foremost, and really try to work it at that level as much as you can. Sometimes you have no choice, you know, to go above and move it up the ladder, um, so to speak. But if you can deal with that individual and say, listen, you know, we're all on the same team here. You know, I am your counsel. You know, what you want is what I want, but we do have some practical problems and we need to talk about that. Um, and just coming from that standpoint, I, you never want it to deteriorate um, to a contentious relationship between you and your client or your client and somebody else within the client. You really want to attempt to avoid that as much as possible. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Um, thank you. I, I just pictured um, that up the letter reporting, um, you know, quote unquote, definitely could have caused um, hairs to be rubbed and unnecessary friction. Um, but I do have a spin off. Mm -hmm. It seems there's a lot of um, people management relationship management skills that are needed there. Do you find that your preparation as an internationally trained lawyer or even in your years as a paralegal, um, did you have an opportunity to develop any of these skills in those roles? I did. Um, as a legal assistant, I trained other legal assistants and then as a paralegal i was trained and then i trained others um, so you know managing that and managing lawyers <laughs> as support staff it's tough sometimes <laughs> lawyers have very uh strong personalities a lot of the time and trying to manage um their expectations in terms of your time uh, managing when you can get, get things finished, uh, being when they are, you know, saying to do A and 
you don't really think that looks right or to bring up those issues. I mean, it's a lot of it is managing individuals and expectations. And I think that really helped because, you know, I actually worked for four lawyers at one point and they all had completely different styles and expected completely different things um, from me. So, at, at, you know, sometimes I had to go into their office and sit down and have a hard conversation. Um, don't avoid the hard conversations, <laughs> whether yeah. it's with a client, you know, your principal while you're articling, um, you know, support staff, you just feel like, you know, things aren't being communicated, or there's some miscommunication, it's much better just to deal with it um, head on. And, you know, come approach it and come into it as though, you know, you have a very humble position that maybe you misunderstood something. Um, I find people are much more willing to open up that way. So I think that it really helped my legal assistant and paralegal experience. And I think uh, being a trained lawyer uh, over in the UK or going to law school in the UK, I think that really helped as well because it, I mean, I didn't have any family or friends over there. So it kind of pushed me to be more outgoing, rely on others, realize I had no idea what was going on <laughs> most of the time. So, you know, you're, you're asking your fellow students, um, you're talking through uh, legal problems together and case law together and just realizing that, you know, it's better if everybody works together <laughs> as much as you can. And coming from a litigator, that sounds very strange, but. <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. I think yeah, that... Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I definitely think that um, it's one of the things that we don't typically hear from litigators is that side of asking others for help. Um, it's something that we don't talk about, but it's something that they just often do naturally. But it's so natural to them um, because they're so, you know, collaborative in so many different ways that it's not a skill set that they think about because it's just who they are a lot of the time. Whereas is it something as um, a solicitor, we talk about all the time because it's something that we don't do very often. <laughs> we tend to sit in our own little bubble and forget that we're often part of a much bigger team on a deal and that that collaboration is so key and important. And as you say, being, you know, having that experience of having studied somewhere else, lived somewhere else, and um, you've learned basically because you've had to, because you've been on your own to like reach out and be like, help me. How do yeah. I do this? How do I take a bus? Because the bus doesn't work the same way as what the bus works at home. You know, like here, I didn't realize that they don't give you change. It took me three years to work out they didn't give me change on the bus. <laughs> like you'd think I'd be a bit smarter than that, but I'm really not. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think asking for help is, is a great asset to to counsel in, in Canada. And I think the legal profession gets a really bad reputation sometimes for lawyers being very, you know, hard or difficult to be around. And we don't often like to admit that we don't know something. Um, my go-to answer from, you know, right up from being a legal assistant to now is if I don't know something, I just say, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. And whether that means me doing research or asking my colleagues or looking into another file with, with a similar situation or even, you know, you know, referring them to somebody else that knows the answer. I think, you know, we're very adaptable and I think there's a lot of support out there within the legal community, you know, right down to the support staff. I mean, if I've always found with support staff, if I very much respect the skills that they have and what they know, then, you know, the same respect is, is returned and things just run much more smoothly. You know, we all have a part to play in it um, to properly uh, service our clients and make sure that, that they get um, the correct information and in a timely manner. So that's kind of been my, my go-to. <laughs> uh, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Hi, Megan. Uh, thank you for taking out the time. And uh, I really, really enjoyed this session. Uh, I had one question. 
Uh, I'm a lawyer uh, uh, with, a, with 10 years experience. Uh, the, the law practice in back home uh, differs from uh, the practice here in terms of two key personalities from what I understood. We don't have legal assistants or we don't have um, uh, paralegals. So I'm not quite sure, I'm not really clear yet what role each of these individuals have. So for example, if in your team, you have a paralegal, an article student, and a legal assistant, what would each of these individuals do in terms of day-to-day uh, -day running of the practice? That would be really good if I had an answer. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, for legal assistants, for example, my legal assistants through all the different areas of law, quite frankly, um, they're very good at keeping all the files organized. Um, they know where all the filing goes. They know where to save all the emails. They know to do all that administrative stuff. They're also very good at managing my calendar when I'm not so good advising me when I have a conflict in time, which I didn't even realize I did. Um, they are also very good at um, drafting form letters, you know, just enclosing something, uh, scanning, uh, faxing, and they do do some preliminary organizational stuff. For right now, my legal assistant is actually training to be a paralegal. Um, so I've been giving her you know, a little bit other tasks here and there. So for example, if I need a chronology on a file or I need her to search um, some decision for something very specific, I'll get her to do that. For paralegals, um, they take on a more active role in the file. Um, the paralegals that I've had at Justice have been amazing. Um, I'm just absolutely blown away with their legal skills, quite honestly. Um, they will review legal arguments. They will cite uh, cases and insert citations. They will do the running of document production. They will uh, double, triple check my redactions. They will actually do of that. When I was a paralegal in immigration, and obviously this is dependent upon the area of law as well. Um, when I was in immigration, the paralegal basically put the entire immig immigration application together, whether it be for a work permit, they would, I actually would draft the submission letter. So our legal argument as to why it should be approved. My boss, the lawyer would review it, sign off on it, follow up with the client, but I would actually come in with the client and get all the preliminary information and craft the initial submission letter. In corporate securities, a lot of the uh, transactional stuff, so getting the uh, share certificates together, um, organizing all of that, uh, the options, putting out the preliminary paperwork for um, a date for closing, um, she basically handled all of that. And same for, for personal injury, the paralegals, had a lot of contact with the clients, um, would initially uh, answer client inquiries if it was you know, a pretty standard inquiry. Hey, did we get that report in? Um, yes, we did. Megan hasn't had a chance to review it yet, but she'll get back to you shortly. Um, can, do you mind sending me a bunch of these documents? Sure. They would also do a preliminary draft of mediation briefs, notices of application. Um, that were pretty standard applications. So it's a little bit more, a lot more drafting of things that were filing or going to be filed with court or going to be submitted, say, to immigration. So it's a little bit more hands-on. For articling students, uh, firms and in general, and also for justice, the general notion is that you're there to learn. <laughs> so they don't expect perfection they know you haven't done this before, and they want to give you tasks that are going to best prepare you to be a lawyer and, and you know, start acting as counsel independently. Um, I know when we had articling students at my last firm, I would take the articling student to a chamber's application in court, and they would speak mm -hmm. to it. If it was a non-contested matter, I would take them down to the court, show them how to vet the order, um, they would 
create their own speaking notes. We would discuss it a bit. And then I would sit in the gallery and they would speak to the application. So that's a practical skill of litigating. Um, Co-chairing on a trial um, is another uh, thing you can do. So being more active in court, drafting the notices of application from scratch rather than asking the paralegal to do it. So there is some overlap there, but just doing it from scratch is so important rather than just solely relying on the paralegal because that's a, that's a legal skill you're going to have to have. How to prepare something that's going to be a legal argument to be filed and knowing the case law in that area of law. So there was a lot more um, activities like that as an example, a lot of memorandum writing. So again, learning the area of law on a particular issue, assisting counsel on a file, but you're brought along to a lot of mediations. Having said that, I actually think our legal profession more uh, needs to bring our staff to court more. <laughs> I mean, and into certain client meetings and into certain, um, you know, atmospheres that normally they kind of get excluded from. And uh, my legal assistant, when she was training to be a paralegal at my last firm, I had a pretty standard application in chambers in court. And I said, do you want to just come sit in for the first, you know, 10 minutes? And you can kind of see what this looks like. So when you're putting together my binder for this, you know like why it's so important to tab things because you'll see the judge is like peppering the lawyers with questions and i think it has a lot more impact um if you know they're meeting the clients face to face they're seeing what it is you actually do it helps them to help you a little bit more does that answer your question yes absolutely thank you very much thank you yeah i would i would agree with exactly that um in terms of being a solicitor as well um there is an overlap between all of them. I know traditionally legal assistants had done a lot more than they do now. Um, they've done a lot more of the basic, simple drafting. Um, whereas now there's much more of a separation, I think. Um, and they're now more of a purely administrative role. But I believe that if you go in, especially if you're in a bigger firm, but if you go into a smaller firm, um, quite often there'll be a big overlap between the legal assistant and the paralegals um, and the type of work that they do just because when there's less people the lines are blurred even more between roles and um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at different sized practices and different practice areas that they do kind of overlap but yeah paralegals them some of them are licensed to go into court now I know they're looking here in BC at giving them additional accreditation so that they have the rights to stand in court um, and do things and also have other obligations, um, which they're all pitching for, which in many cases they are far more qualified for than I would ever be to do. So um, I, think you, I think you raised a good point as well. I think even though there's a lot of um, overlap, the smaller firms, you're gonna get a lot of hands-on experience um, because the reality is, you just have less resources. <laughs> so um, there is gonna be more opportunities probably presented to be a little bit more mobile and have a little bit more overlap uh, generally. And I think that goes for junior counsel as well. Junior counsel, you know, if a big file comes in and it's all hands on deck, it's not just gonna be the senior counsel handling it by themselves. Um, it probably is gonna trickle down to you having some part in that, which is really great. Uh, Joad, do you wanna answer? ask your question hi Megan it's an absolute pleasure hearing you speak and um, you know I learned so many things from this um, talk I just wanted to follow up on something that Zakir already asked um, is there something known as a, a law clerk in Canada do they do they at all have a role like in England and in Bangladesh we know that we have law clerks who deal with some of the things that you mentioned uh, a paralegal uh, mentioned as a paralegal's responsibility so yes yeah. there's there's legal clerks um for judges and for courthouses um so often um you can clerk in those positions um they're very high very highly sought after positions because there's only so many um but they do do some of the similar tasks and they're also um vetting certain arguments and you know assisting with administrative tasks as well yeah 
So, so lawyers do not have clerks. It's, it's basically a judicial position. My understanding is yes, I've, I've been clerked um, at all, but you don't have them in um, law firms, no. no. Thank you. I think, I think in this case, I think uh, the legal, uh, legal assistant is the law clerk we are used to back in our country. Okay, yeah. So I, I, it does the administrative stuff with... and filing. Uh, okay, yeah. And somewhere between the legal administrative assistant and um, uh, paralegal. That's mm -hmm. what we call a law clerk. Okay, that's where the confusion yeah. comes in for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, we don't have that. We've got legal assistants. Um, we also have other general administrative staff that assist with running of the private practice firm or running of, um, you know, public service. But we have, for lawyers, there's usually distinct a legal assistant and a paralegal. And it's also very common that legal assistants and paralegals are shared amongst several lawyers. Um, so there's a lot of also being mindful of that when you're either a legal assistant or paralegal managing all the different counsel and their different practices. And from a lawyer standpoint, if I put you know, a task on a paralegal or a legal assistant that's pretty short lived, you know, rather urgent, need you to drop everything and do it now, I'll always check to see um, if they've got some other pressing matters with some of the other counsel. And if so, then I might ask somebody else to step in and help out because I realize I'm not the only one they're working with. <laughs> And that's kind of I'm um, on to for the legal assistant and the paralegal. This is what you're talking about, um, you know, managing the lawyers is that as a legal assistant or a paralegal, one of the skills you have to learn is almost standing up for yourself and saying, you know what, I don't actually have time to do that right now. I've got X, Y, Z for this person and ABC for this other person and they all need it. And you're all giving me competing deadlines. Um, and then, it, then you put it back on the lawyer to go back and talk to the other lawyers about, you know, who needs the priority. Like, because some people just always say this is urgent and needs doing. But urgent doesn't necessarily always mean urgent in my experience. Um, so it's something that I learned um, pretty quickly when I was working as a legal assistant and also when I was doing my training contract in the UK was to ask people what they meant by urgent. Does urgent actually mean I need to drop everything and do it right now? Or does urgent mean you need to do it before the end of the day or by lunchtime tomorrow? Like, what's your definition of urgent? <laughs> well, and that's, that's a good point. That's a good point to carry through the entire legal practice, so whether you're a legal assistant, paralegal, student, or counsel. I think telling your client, you know, they say, get this to me as soon as possible. You say, okay, well, what's the latest date you need it? And now you've created an actual time frame for yourself. Um, same thing with support staff. I've asked them, you know, I really need this to go out urgently. And they said, well, Megan, what's urgent? <laughs> and I said, well, it needs to be filed no later than 4 p.m. tomorrow. Oh, so I have till tomorrow. Okay, well, this, you know, I can go and have my lunch then today. You know, <laughs> So I think they very much appreciate it. The more um, direct you can be about it. Um, whether you're asking for clarity or you're giving it, it's, uh, it helps manage those expectations. Managing expectations throughout is a, is a constant um, learning skill that you're going to have to just continuously hone. <laughs> and with clients as well, um, because clients often, their matter is always urgent. And especially as you become busier and busier in your practice because you become more senior, um, you've got com competing demands from different clients, whether they're internal clients or external clients, um, and learning how to prioritize that and asking your client, is it urgent? And I have, to have had to say to one of my clients, please don't write every email as urgent because they're not always urgent and now I ignore all of them. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's like work out a system of what is urgent. Um, and it's about, as you were saying, setting those expectations early on. Um, and I find, I find also setting the expectations. That I think we're, we're, we are our own worst enemy. <laughs> a lot of the time, if somebody comes to us and asks us to do something very quickly, we want to do everything for everyone all the time. You know, our, our job as counsel is to problem solve and to fix things and to uh, facilitate getting to a certain end. So we always wanna you know, say yes, we can do it. 
And sometimes we expect the reaction to be extremely negative. And I've been pleasantly surprised. <laughs> you know, I've had clients come back to me and say, I completely understand. No worries. Get it to me as soon as you can. Or, oh, that's not a problem. Next week's fine. And I was surprised because I, I thought they were going to say, no, I need it now. <laughs> Oh, the number of times that's happened to me and I've stayed up and worked on it all night and then found out they didn't need it till the following week. And you're like, oh my God, if only I'd asked, if only I'd asked, I could have actually gone to sleep last night on that one. Um, so I know we're getting close to time. Um, does anyone else have a question? Zakir, is your hand up? Oh, no, I, I, I raised my hand before I asked that question. So I think it's still up. I'll just get it down. Okay, no, that's Sorry. I just didn't want to miss anybody out. I actually had one no. question for you, Megan, though. Um, so the traditional mindset that I have of a defense lawyer is that you're on call pretty much 24 hours a day um, because you can be called at all times of the night. Is that the same now that you're working at DOJ? Are you, you know, do you have those same time constraints or is it a little bit more work-life balance? I'd say there's more work-life balance. Um, I was never, any time in my profession, I've never really been on call at all hours of the night, thank goodness. I think criminal defense lawyers are, I think family lawyers are. Um, I haven't had that experience. I've, I've definitely got in the trenches in the middle of a trial where I've got clients that, you know, we're all staying up late because we're in court the next day and there's an issue or an argument that needs to really be hammered out. And, you know, it seems stressful, but it's actually quite a bit of fun because we're all in it together. And it's when you're in the office when nobody else is there except for your team, your immediate team. So it's, it's a lot of fun. But I haven't had um, the experience of being called at all hours. It's actually been quite good. Public practice, um, it is a little bit more balanced. In, in the public sector, I find, but it also depends on where you're at in your career and what area of law you're in, I think. I think a lot, especially with the pandemic um, current situation, I think a lot of employers are realizing that, you know, employees and lawyers, I mean, we like to work. <laughs> you know we do and um despite all of the you know challenges of being remote and not having access to my staff you know down the hall and not having um the printer and the big screens and everything everybody is still working very hard and being pretty productive um, so I think there's going to be some flexibility, especially in the private practice going back. I think this whole notion of, you know, you got to put in FaceTime um, at the law firm. I think there's some value to that, to create in-person relationships, to be able to work with people um, on files in person and work through a problem. I think there's some value in that, but I don't think it's going to be as stringent as it was uh, prior to this pandemic. I think hopefully there's gonna be a little bit more flexibility um, for people to work alternative hours, work from home, and be able to juggle everything else in life. Um, as lawyers, we think we can do it all, and sometimes you can't. <laughs> you just can do your best. I mean, we can do it all, we just can't necessarily do it all at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of my favorite um, Sheryl Sandberg quotes is, you know, we can have it all, just not all at the same time. Um, you know, we need to have some separation, but oh yeah, that's good to know though. I'm glad I'm not the only one who's feeling that too. I actually brought my big monitors home with me um, because the multitude of documents at once, I was like, there's not a chance to do a 15 inch laptop screen. Um, so no, I did a giant, giant document review on my little, little laptop and I can say it was slow going. <laughs> Yeah, I can believe it. My, my husband's an engineer and he's trying to look at all these different blueprints on one tiny 15 inch screen and it's really not happening very well for him at all. I feel a bit it's, test, it's a test of patience. I know. And I have this entire like Starship Enterprise thing going on in front of me here. Uh, so I think we have time for one more question. If anybody has one more question for Megan, otherwise we're going to let her go and go back to her family um, because I'm sure it's getting close to bedtime. Yes. Raghav, Rajav, I probably butchered uh, yes. I apologize. Hi. Hi, uh, thank you so much. I think this has been very informative, but just a small brief about myself. So I'm still in law school back home. 
and i plan on moving uh, maybe this year or maybe next year due to the global pandemic i think the plan might be delayed by a year mm -hmm. so i have received an offer from the university of toronto for an llm in uh, business law mm -hmm. and as i understand from i mean as i've been listening since so long so my questions are more about the process as compared to what it actually entails later on uh so uh so the first thing would be so is it really helpful to get an llm program because i am getting a i'm getting a feeling that it might be much more worth it if i go for uh let's say a law clerk or a paralegal position before i actually enter into the legal system yeah, that is the age old question <laughs> i have to say i struggled with this when i got out of uh, law school i you know i loved school so i was kind of toying with the idea of going and getting um, an LLM. And I ended up, you know, not doing it, but I did have friends of mine that graduated with me that did. Um, to this, at this point, we're both practicing in Vancouver. We're both at, you know, we were around the same year of call and both got there in different avenues. It really depends on what your comfort level would be and even you getting an llm obviously doesn't preclude you from you know being a paralegal or a legal assistant unless there's specific training required in the province that you're in um i think i think an llm isn't definitely an asset i mean firms do take it into consideration i know that if your law degree is done from outside of canada it's something that comforts firms because they recognize it it's done in canada it's a you know it's designated from a canadian university that they're familiar with um, so it does carry some weight when looking for articles and looking for training here um, but it does depend on your comfort level if you think that you know being a legal sister and paralegal would be better suited to kind of get your feet wet first and figure out where you um where you lie in terms of whether this is something you want to proceed with, or if you're sure you want to be counsel, um, you know, you should just get in there and go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't be very helpful. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult question to, to answer because it's very, um, it's a personal question and it's a little bit subjective as well, because it really depends on um, how firms are perceiving it. But I do know that, you know, my friends with LMs, they've all found articles, they've all gone through the articling process and their counsel now. Yeah, and I also think it's worth bearing in mind that um, paralegals here in um, Canada, they quite often require that you have a paralegal designation. So it's not as simple as just rocking up and applying for a paralegal position. Um, they do often want you to have gone to paralegal school. So if it's a toss up between an LLM and doing a paralegal course, and you know you want to be a lawyer, ultimately, keep that in mind because you're gonna to have to go to school for one or two years to be a paralegal, and then you're gonna be working as a paralegal, and then you're gonna, and then you're gonna do your NCA exams, and then you're gonna ask calls. So it's just more time, um, and also cost. There's always a cost involved as well, like LLMs aren't cheap, and the paralegal course is not super cheap either. Um, so it's, as Megan says, it's very personal. Um, it's very, you know, depending on your situation. Um, one advantage I have been told from people who have done an LLM, I didn't do an LLM. I just wrote the NCA exams when I moved to Canada. Um, and was that when you're at doing an LLM, you're in a law school. So you have all of those connections that the law school has. So you have the automatic on-campus recruiting, you have all of the events that the um, law firms come to and are at, you have opportunities to meet with them and speak with them, which as an NCA student on your own, you don't have because the NCA process doesn't have anything like that set up. So it's much more on you to go and do the networking, um, which Megan was talking about at the beginning, which is really important um, when you're coming from a different jurisdiction, um, whether you're from Canada or originally, or you know, you're brand new to Canada, is that you need to build up that professional network. Um, and whether it's a peer network or a network at different levels, um, and whether you do an LLM or you go through the legal assistant paralegal route, um, there's still going to be hurdles. 
um, to get over. And just because you get a legal assistant position or a paralegal position in a firm doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to get an articling position with that firm. That's um, I worked as a legal assistant for almost five years with a firm here in Canada whilst I was getting my immigration status um, sorted out and um, whilst I was doing my NCA exams and I didn't article with that firm. I ended up articling somewhere completely different. Um, so it's not an automatic guarantee. It's very much, you know, you have to, you have to be in the right place at the right time and you have to build those connections. Um, so it's definitely worth considering, um, but think about what your personal situation is and what your family situation is. You know, if you have a family at home, how much more studying do you want to do and how much more time do you have to give to this process? I think it's also a good, important, a good point that you clarified there. I was a legal assistant for over five years um, and being, you know, kind of, you know, moved to a paralegal from being a legal assistant um, internally is not a very common thing. Um, you know, as you pointed out, it's often you have to go through training. Often the the courses, uh, the institutions that offer the courses, they often have some sort of referral um, program lined up with the uh, firms. So the firms will only get, you know, paralegals that have graduated from a particular uh, college and have gone through that because they really like that program and they feel like that program has really served them well for staffing their firm. Um, so it's not common to, uh, just become a paralegal or a legal assistant and move up internally. It's, I would say it's more of the rare scenario. I was very lucky uh, with my situation. I know, yeah. well, you're my third now. That's two in Canada and one in the UK that I've ever heard of. <laughs> and I think it also really helped me being on the West Coast, um, the East Coast of Canada. They're very much into the training. Um, I actually think it's a requirement now um, for them to be trained um, and have that designated education rather than the lawyer just being confident in your work. Right, right. That is really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, on that note, I'm gonna say, Megan, thank you so much. I have learned so much today myself. I'm sure everybody else here has as well. Um, we will be putting this video onto our YouTube channel. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, you, know, you can post them on our Facebook page, you can contact us on LinkedIn, you can contact us on YouTube. Um, yeah, by all means, get in touch, send your questions. Our series continues next week um, where we will be talking to a family lawyer. So anyone who's got any interest in family law, tune in next week for that one. Megan, thank you so much again. Um, good luck. Hope everything goes well. Hope you get your big screens back soon, given the announcement from the BC government today. It sounds like we, um, we might be starting to go back into the offices at some point in the not too distant future on that one, but we'll watch the space. Yeah, I miss the client contact and you know my colleagues for sure. And thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody for, for joining and your wonderful questions. It, it's been great connecting with all of you. Absolutely, great. All right guys, thank you very much. Thank you.